Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Also, DwyerBoxingNews.com, here online for podcasts. You know what? The NBA draft can't get here soon enough for me. I understand that media is all about getting ratings. I understand that fully. But I also know that these 18, 19, and 20-year-old guys they're interviewing aren't the most interesting people in the world. Let's be blunt, right? If you were out and you wanted to know someone's life story, aren't you going to stop someone a little bit older, someone who actually has lived a little bit off of a college campus, someone who may have actually you know, had a career or lived in a big city someplace or at least distinguished themselves in the profession somewhat before you talk to some guy who's not far removed from his high school graduation. Right? That's the first thing. The second thing, too, is let's face it. All of these guys are auditioning all the time before the NBA draft. And we already know that the audition doesn't include truthful answers to real questions, right? Every athlete has dreamt forever of being a star basketball player, right? That's their goal in life because the system set up where you can't say things like, you know what, actually, uh, my passion is writing, but because I'm 6'10 with a low post game and back to the basket skills and because they pay so much in the NBA, I thought I'd play NBA basketball for six or seven years, make some money so that I could afford to do what I really want to do, right? You can't say that in an NBA interview, nor can you say, you know what, it's just about the money for me, right? You're going to pay me millions of dollars. Hey, what else am I going to do to get myself millions of dollars in my 20s legally? Right? I'm, I'm taking the money even though winning an NBA championship is not at the top of my list of life accomplishments. Right? You know, maybe you have a dream to produce a movie. Maybe you have a dream to cure cancer. Right? Certainly there are more worthwhile things to do in life than simply win basketball games for some multimillionaire. But of course you can't say that in interviews. Right? They'll look at you and they'll say, hey, you know what, this guy might be bad for the locker room. <laughs> you know what, this guy might not, you know, if he has too much of another life, this guy might not completely gel with our corporate sponsors. And isn't it about the sponsors? You know in an interview you can say things like, you know what, you know, I only wear Nike. Right? To a team that has an exclusive contract with Reebok in their arena. Right? And let's face it too. You and I know that a lot of these coaches in college basketball have real personal problems, right? Some of these coaches implode. From time to time, we actually have tapes of coaches hitting players, right? Remember the Bobby Knight tape? Cursing at players, right? On tape, we've had other well-known coaches accused of having sexual liaisons in bars. I'm not going to say, you know, name names. Just Google it, right? These are some of the biggest names in coaching. Right Then, of course, you have the coaches who have been on probation with the NCAA or have gotten teams on probation multiple times. Again, these are elite coaches in the NCAA. I don't know why we think of them as statesmen or as priests or as innate role models. They're not. They're businessmen. But, of course, you know the rest. Because of the fallacy, because of the whole corporate... BS going on, all of these guys say, oh, coach was great, right? Guy could have been playing for a Nazi in college. He's going to say, oh, he was great. He was a real role model. He was the father I never had. I've learned so many life lessons from this guy, right? And think about these schools. Come on, some of these schools have, what, two black students who aren't on the basketball team? Right? Some of these schools, you know, have had big time problems. In other words, you look at the graduation rates of these athletes, low. You look at the job prospects of some of these athletes, low. You look at the support some of these schools have given these athletes, 
poor. Right? But yet, of course, these kids who want to be drafted high by NBA teams know that to play the game, they have to say things like, oh, I've always wanted to play for the university I attended. And, oh, I was so blessed to play for this university and stuff like that. You know that's the game. So you see these guys, they're wearing suits, they're wearing ties. You and I know that that's not what these guys really want to be wearing because that's not what they wear when they're off the court during the season. But agents, PR people have gotten to them and said, hey, get the haircut. Hey, you need to clean up the dreads, right? Hey, that gold tooth, you want to keep your mouth closed. Hey, pull up the shirt above the neck tattoo, right? You know, it's like, look, I know that, you know, when you're talking to me, you're using words like, um, you know, uh, the F word, uh, the MF word, uh, you and I are calling each other the N word. You know what? When the cameras are rolling, you need to act like you're talking to a priest, right? So these guys are using words they don't even use in their lives, right? So please, let's have the NBA draft happen sooner rather than later so these guys can stop the dog and pony show. I feel sorry for these athletes. They're in such an impossible position. I remember when Allen Iverson left Georgetown. He was well scrubbed. You know, he you know used the King's English and stuff like that. In my opinion, he didn't become interesting until a few years into his NBA career, when he was able to, you know, wear braids, when he was able to have his body the way he wanted, have the tattoos the way he wanted, when he was able to talk the way he wanted, when he was a multimillionaire and didn't have his collegiate eligibility or playing time hang on every word he said. You want to know how BS the system is? And it is what it is, right? You know, um, it is what it is. I understand the team's perspective. We're about to pay millions of dollars to someone. We need to find out who they are, right? I understand that. Also, I do understand that corporate sponsors, hey, that's real money. That's financially floating your organization. You do need to make sure that the guy you draft isn't going to alienate your revenue stream. I get it. I get it. Understand, though, it's all dog and pony. The system so bogus, think about it. I'm going to name some of the biggest players in NBA history who, if they were completely real, if they kept it real during the interview process, might not have been drafted early. Could you imagine Michael Jordan? Right? He's the best I've seen. Just point blank. Right? The best I've seen. I was, I'm a little bit too young for the Wilt Chamberlain era. Right? I saw Magic. Magic wasn't close to the defender MJ was. Could you imagine MJ talking and saying, hey, look, you know, yeah, I like to smoke cigars. I like to gamble. In fact, I like to gamble big money. Right? Not $1 bills, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, according to reports on the golf course. Right? You can imagine you're... NBA prospect, you mentioned gambling, er, wrong thing to say, right? You're on the off ramp. The interviewer is going to smile at you and, you know, treat you well, you're not getting picked. What about Charles Barkley? He knows his way around a casino by his own admission. Could you imagine Charles Barkley being blunt in an interview? Could you imagine Charles Barkley saying, hey, when an unruly fan touches me, I'm going to defend myself, right? This might lead to several altercations with fans. Look up Barkley's history, right? You know if Towns or Okafor says, hey, some unruly fan comes up to me, I'm going to defend myself. There might be altercations. There are going to be some nights where I hope an unruly fan touches me. And, of course, yes, I do believe that I have the right to legally gamble in Las Vegas casinos, Charles Barkley's not getting picked. Could you imagine Wilt Chamberlain or Magic Johnson talking to these teams? And then the team says, hey, do you have a girlfriend? And Wilt Chamberlain says, oh, you know, I like the ladies. Yeah, I have a few girlfriends. You know, I'm on my way to, well, by my count, 10,000. 
women, right? Or magic, you know, hey, I, I like the ladies. You know, girlfriend, wow, that's that's a hard term. You mean you mean women I've been with? You know, yes, I have a girlfriend, but you know, I also have other women who uh, might consider themselves my girlfriend, right? All I'm saying is your team would be lucky in any draft to draft MJ, Barkley, Wilt, or Magic. If you're a fan, you're hoping your team drafts those guys because those guys get you jewelry, right? In Barkley's case, at least he gets you to the NBA Finals, right? These are big winners. Let's hope when your team picks an NBA prospect, they pick one based on talent because if your team is picking a guy based on personality and not talent, you're not going to win an NBA title. Let's shift gears. Let's talk about a lie you're being told right now. I'm not going to name names. I don't want to be sued. But some people out there are telling you that David Lemieux can't fight Gennady Golovkin because he has a different mandatory contender. And he has to fight his mandatory contender to protect his title. Right? So a Lemieux Triple G match can't happen. Isn't that poppycock? Hey man, why lie to me at all? Right? I'm a boxing fan. I'm helping to financially support the sport. Right? If I care enough about David Lemieux, why would you lie to me, one of the fans who cares about David Lemieux, to want him to fight Triple G, right? First of all, feel lucky I know who David Lemieux is. But now you're going to come at me with this fairy tale? Come on, man. The bottom line is this. Let's use common sense. Triple G has a share of the title at middleweight. He's a title holder at middleweight. David Lemieux now is a title holder at middleweight. Both of these guys have titles. So if they announced a fight against the other person, understand one of them is going to leave the ring with the title. It's just like a title defense. Even if one gets stripped, let's say David Lemieux does get stripped before the fight. All he has to do is win the fight and he has a title. Let me say this too, boxing fans are smarter than we look. Let's say both guys get stripped. Right? Just imagine, boxing's ridiculous already. You and I know it is. Let's say both guys get stripped. You're the boxing fan. Who are you going to consider to have a share of the middleweight championship? Some guy handed the belt out of the garbage can? Some guy who has to go to the commission? to get a belt from the commission or the guy who wins the Golovkin David Lemieux match right let's be real here right the fact that both Lemieux and Golovkin have titles means that they can fight each other put another way let's shift gears heavyweight division right Deontay Wilder has a title Vladimir Klitschko has several titles. Understand, Deontay Wilder's mandatory is Alexander Povetkin. But you and I know the way it goes. If Deontay Wilder said, hey, wait a moment, you know what? If I'm going to take the risk in fighting Povetkin, and if Vladimir Klitschko wants to fight me, why don't I go for the guy who's the long-standing champion, the guy who, if I beat him, is going to enhance my legacy the most? Right, so if Deontay Wilder fought Vladimir Klitschko, even if the WBC stripped Deontay Wilder of his belt, if he beats Vladimir Klitschko, are you, the boxing fan, going to consider him the heavyweight title? Wouldn't he pick up Klitschko's belts? So don't believe the foolishness you're hearing about obstacles in the way of David Lemieux fighting Triple G. Let me say something else, too. You know what? The sport's really not about titles. It's about money. 
This is professional prize fighting. These guys are risking their lives. They deserve something back. If I'm David Lemieux, I have to look at the money involved in my next opponent. Right? If I can get X fighting a mandatory, and I can get 4 or 5X fighting Janady Golovkin, why would I take the risk of getting X when I can get 4 or 5X? Right? That Golovkin fight would be huge. You don't think that in Boxing Savvy Canada, that fight doesn't sell out the Bell Center? Lemieux's very popular as it is. Let me say this too, betting-wise, how I would bet that fight. You know what? I just don't know if Lemieux or Golovkin have the survival skills necessary to deal with getting hit with hard shots, right? Possibly getting dropped, then getting off the canvas, defending themselves, and surviving. Right? David Lemieux gets stopped by Marco Antonio Rubio, his corner who know who knew him best, threw in the towel, right? Wouldn't let him continue in that fight. Right? Golovkin, quite frankly, hasn't been tested. We haven't seen the fight where Golovkin is on the canvas, or where Golovkin gets hit and has to hold on. You show me a fight like this between two hunters. And I'm going to bet distance, not outcome. In that fight, I believe the play would be that that fight doesn't go the distance. Right? Put another way, if your casino doesn't have that prop, I'd take both guys by KO and I would structure the bet so that I get paid if either happens. In other words, more on this guy, less on this guy. If the net result is, if either guy wins, I make a profit, right? When you see two front foot heavy hunters, understand, surviving in the ring takes a different skill set than punching, right? Surviving requires holding on to guys, right? Surviving requires pacing, right? Making it to the end of the round. Right? Sometimes you're going to have to be on your back foot running. Sometimes you're going to have to be turning an opponent. Right? I'm not sure if these guys have those skills. I really am not. I would expect somebody to get knocked out. You're talking about guys with a greater than 80% KO ratio. Both of them. Right? That means most of their fights end by KO as it is. Right? I believe you would get favorable odds from the casino because Hassan and Jikum, Hassan Endum, is good on his back foot. He's a mover. He's able to get up after KOs. He can survive. He got knocked down several times by David Lemieux. He went the distance. I'm guessing casual fans are going to look at that outcome and think that Golovkin can go the distance against Lemieux. I'm not sure if either guy can make it the distance against each other. The gambling play I'd be pursuing in Lemieux against Golovkin is I would expect that fight to end inside of the distance. If either guy is a decided underdog, let's say Lemieux is a 2-1 to one underdog or 3-1 to one underdog, then the way I would structure the bet, even though I don't think the fight goes the distance, but if you're going to give me an underdog at pretty huge odds, then I'll take the underdog simply to win the fight. And I'd hedge the play with the favorite by KO. This way, if the fight went the distance, I'd even have that outcome covered if the underdog won the distance fight. Right? So think it through. I'm betting distance on the Lemieux Triple G fight if it happens. I'm saying the fight doesn't go the distance. If the odds are haphazard, if they're staggered, then I'll take the underdog simply to win the fight, hedged with the favorite by KO. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.